In this video, I'm going to show you how to get started with ESP Home. It's a great app for integrating DIY smart sensors like this one into Home Assistant. And whether you're just getting started with ESP Home or if you're fumbling your way through it, or if you consider yourself an ESP Home expert and just looking for a couple of tips and tricks, then this video might be for you. So let's dive in. So firstly, I'm going to give you a quick overview of how ESP Home works, and then I'm going to show you different ways that you can install ESP Home, and then I'm going to show you how to understand and structure the YAML files, and then finally, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So we're going to have a physical switch, and that's going to create a switch in Home Assistant, and then we're going to use a PIR sensor and have that as a sensor in Home Assistant as well. So firstly, what actually is ESP Home? Well, it's a piece of software that's component based, so you can add lots of different components together and create a piece of firmware, which you then upload to one of these devices. Most commonly, you will create temperature and humidity sensors, but there is a lot more it can do as well. Lately, the most powerful tool is the Bluetooth proxy, which allows you to link Bluetooth devices through one of these to Home Assistant, instead of having a Bluetooth dongle directly on your Home Assistant instance. So that's really useful. Another really common use case for ESP Home is presence detection. So in this video, I'm going to show you a PIR sensor, but there's lots of other types of presence sensors as well. So you can have Bluetooth sensors, and also lately, MM Wave sensors have become really popular. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to install the ESP Home add-on in Home Assistant. So just go to the add-on store and search for ESP Home and then install it. And then from there, you'll have a menu on the left-hand side where you can navigate ESP Home and you'll be able to add your devices. So now that we've got that installed, we're going to press new device. It's got some information here about it not having a secure connection. So my browser hasn't got a secure connection, which means that I can't actually install it directly from ESP Home in here. I'm going to need to use the web version instead, but I'll show you that shortly. So for now, we're going to press continue. And now it's asking me to create a new configuration. So this is the name of the device. It's also asking for Wi-Fi credentials. Now this is because we haven't got any set up yet because it's the first device. Once we've done it once, it won't ask again and they'll be stored in the secrets file up here. Let's press next. And now you've got to select the device type. So as you can see here, it now supports the Raspberry Pi Pico W, which is great. ESP8266, which we're going to use and then the ESP32 and a few other variants that have also been added recently. So now we've done that, we can see it's created a new configuration file and it's asking us to install it. But we're not going to do that for now, we're going to press skip and have a look at the configuration. So if you press edit, you can see this is the configuration. Now this is just some default configuration. It's got the Wi-Fi settings here, but not much else really. So now we want to install this default config onto the ESP device and then going forwards we will be able to update it wirelessly. So let's press the three dots and press install and it will take us back to these options of what we can do to install it. So at the moment we can't do it wirelessly. We can't do it via this computer plugged in from this interface because I haven't got a secure HTTPS connection. And we can't do it via the server because this computer I'm running it on isn't the computer that's running Home Assistant. So we're going to do manual download and then it allows us to download the file. As you can see here, it's suggesting that we use the modern format for the website. So now it's compiling the firmware and then we will be able to have a file to upload to the device. So that took a couple of minutes to complete, but it's now finished and you can see that it's downloaded a bin file. So to go to the website, we can cheat and press new device and then press open ESP home web. Now let's press connect. And this is the device here. It's a bit of a strange name, but I know that this is the device because this is the COM port that was added when I plugged it in. So if we now press connect, now what we want to do, instead of pressing prepare for first time use, we want to press install. And then it's going to allow us to choose that file that we just created. So here's the bin file. Let's double click that, press install. We can see that it's erasing the flash memory on the device to start off with, and then it should add the new firmware. Great, so that says it's installed, so let's press close, and now let's go back to ESP Home. Once you've got your device set up in ESP Home, then it should appear automatically as an integration in Home Assistant. You might need to press configure and then add it to Home Assistant, but then you'll be able to see all of the entities for that device. So we can now see that the device is showing us online, and we can also see it's picked up another ESP Home device as well, one of my Bluetooth proxies. So if we press logs and then wirelessly, 
and we should be able to see some information. You can see it's connected to the device wirelessly and it's working as expected. Now let's go to the integration section and see if it's discovered it. Here we go, so we can see we've got a test one device here. So we're going to press configure. Now that it's been configured, you can see that it's got one panel for all of the SP home devices that have already been set up as integrations. So test one is the one we're interested in. You can see it's got one device and one entity. So if we press here, we can see that it hasn't actually really got any proper entities. And that's because it's just a default configuration at the moment. So well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add our capacitive touch button to the configuration and connect it up to the ESP device. So to update the code, we just need to press edit and then make the amendments here. I'm going to paste this code for now and I'll explain it later. So we press save and then install and then it gives us the options again of how to install it. But now we've already got it installed, we can do wirelessly. This will again take a minute or two to update the firmware on the device. So now it's uploading to the device itself. And there we go, it's done. You can now see that it's connecting to the Home Assistant instance and it says that it's successfully connected. What we can actually do now is press stop, confusingly, that doesn't actually stop the device, it just exits out of this. We're now going to click back into this integration, and we can see there's now two entities. So, we can see here the touch button. So you can see at the moment that the sensor is showing that the touch button is on, but that's because I haven't got the touch button connected to the device yet. And you can see here the different pins on the ESP device, and you can see here this is the touch button, and it's got a ground connection, a VCC, which is the plus voltage, and then an IO pin, which is going to be an input pin in here. So we, all we need to do is connect these three wires up to here. So we're going to use D2, which is this one here, and then we're going to connect these three wires. So let's do that now, and then as soon as we do that, we will see, or we should see at least, that the touch button will show us off until I press the button. So I'm going to connect this to the 3.3 volts because these buttons can actually deal with down to two volts. Here we go, so you see I've connected it and the touch button is showing us off. And now I'm going to press the button, hold it and you can see it shows on. Release and it shows off. With these touch buttons, you can actually configure them so that when you press them, they latch on, so that it will stay on and then press it again to go off. Or you can have it as it's set at the moment, whereby you hold it and then it shows that it's on and you release and it shows that it's off. To do that, you need to amend the pads on the back. So there's an A and a B solder pad and you have to solder those if you want them to do different behavior. So now on to the PIR example. So it's the same setup as the touch button basically, but just a different pin number. So we're going to be using D1 instead. So you can see as I move or wave my hand in front of it, then it's going to go to on. So looking at the wiring, we've got ground here, and then we've got the signal line, the input to here, and then we've got the five volt line. So we've got here, we've connected to the D1, here ground, and here 5 volt. So on the D1 Mini, we have 5 volts available and 3.3 volts available because we've got 5 volts coming in from the USB port and then we've got a voltage regulator on board that can downregulate it to 3.3 volts. For this sensor, we need 5 volts, so I'm using the 5 volt one. Whilst we're talking about voltage, this needs between 5 volts and 12 volts to work. However, it has got an onboard regulator itself. So what you actually can do if you need to run it from 3.3 volts is you see this pin here actually bypasses the voltage regulator. And so you could plug it into 3.3 volts on the microcontroller and this spare pin here. So now you've got your sensor working and you've got an entity and home assistant that you can use. So all you need to do now is create an automation and then use these sensors as a trigger. In this example, we've only used binary sensor for both of them, but there's lots of different other types of inputs and outputs available for ESP Home. So just take a look at the documentation and there's a lot of examples for most things, so you should be able to figure it out. It's worth noting that different pins on the microcontroller have different functionality. Some are for input, some for output, some for both, some are for analog, some are for digital. And in this example, we've used digital inputs, but you need to choose the pins carefully as well. So for this device, D1, D2, 5, 6 and 7 are your safe pins. So I've used D1 and D2 here. 
It's worth noting also that pull down and pull up resistors can be used to make things more reliable. So what I've done for these is, is they pull down by default. So in the configuration, I've set them to pull up. And that means that false positives will be reduced. So before we wrap things up, let's have a quick run through the config file and I'll show you some things you can use. So starting at the top, we've got an ESP home section, which I don't really tend to touch other than the name and the friendly name. So you just name that what you want for the device. The next section you've got board, so this is the board type, so I'm using a D1 Mini, but as you can see here if you hover over it and you press this list, it will give you a list of all the different boards. So for example you might use a Node MCU instead of a D1 Mini, so you need to put something different here for that. Now for the logger you can select different logging modes, so you can have debug and verbose etc, so that if you need more logging information if you've got issues then you can define that here. And again, it gives you links if you hover over it to the documentation where you can see more about it. The API section is how Home Assistant communicates with the ESP device. So when you create a new device, it automatically creates one of these for you. The OTA section means over the air, and that's for over the air updates. So you can define a password here, which is auto generated normally, so that not anyone can just do updates to your devices without your permission. The Wi-Fi section is fairly self-explanatory, so the SSID of the Wi-Fi access point and the password, but you can also define other things like whether you want it to be a static IP address. AP is an access point, as it says here, so it's a failover access point. If it can't communicate with your Wi-Fi, then it will create its own access point so that you can still get into the device. The captive portal section relates to the AP section above, so basically it just gives you a front end so that you can access things if it can't get onto the Wi-Fi. And then this is the section that I added. So going through this, we've got a binary sensor section and then these are different sensors. So we've got two sensors set up. So the platform I've chosen is GPIO because we were having it as an input. For the pin number, you can normally put something like GPIO4 here, for example, but with the D1 Mini, you can actually put the D number that's on the device itself instead, so it just makes it a bit easier. And then the mode, that's whether it's an input or not. So here I've got input true, and then also I've got the pull-up section set to true, which means there's a pull-up resistor that gets enabled. So the name is the name of the entity that will appear in Home Assistant. It will get prefixed with the name of the device just to ensure that it's unique. So one bit of functionality which can be useful, especially if you're using it lots of times within your script, I mean this is a fairly small script, but if it's a bigger script then you might use the same variable multiple times. So what you can do is, is you can use something called substitutions. So here you can have a substitution section and then you can have the name of the variable and then the value of the variable and then you can reference that further down. So say if I wanted to access that for the name for example, then I would do this. So you do dollar sign, open brackets and then the name of the variable and then close the brackets. Another section that's quite useful is packages. You'll probably see some references to that sometimes, especially if you've got Bluetooth proxies. So here's an example of a Bluetooth proxy reference using a package, and then it's got the URL here. We can actually go to that URL on GitHub and see what it looks like. So if you look here, you can see that it's just simply a YAML configuration. So this package just contains some other information that it will then include in your YAML file. There's some good documentation on the substitution and package sections. So if you have a look in the documentation here, you can see there's a substitution section and there's a packages section. So have a read through that. And finally, I'm going to show you web server. So if you put this in, you can define any port number you like, but it creates a front end for the ESP device. And that means that without Home Assistant, you can actually have a look at the entity states. So I'm going to save this, upload it to the device, and then show you what it looks like. So I've now uploaded the new firmware to the device and then I've just gone to the URL of the device, so test1.local. You could use the IP address instead. And as you can see, it's got the two entities here that I set up for this video, so PIR and touch button. And you can see that the PIR is showing us on at the moment and the touch button is showing us off. So now I'm just going to go in front of the PIR and the state should change to on. And there you go, there's a few bits to hopefully get you started using ESP Home. I've seen some examples online where they don't show you using the pull-up configuration and this is where you can get into trouble and have false positives. Another reason why you can have false positives if you've got an unstable voltage. So make sure that you've got a good voltage input, it's the correct voltage and it's a good power supply. 
Well, hopefully I've shown you enough in this video to help you get started with ESP Home. I'll probably revisit this topic and I'll connect lots of other different sensors to ESP Home because there's lots out there. You can go on AliExpress and get loads of different sensors for just a couple of dollars each. So that's it for today. Please consider subscribing if you liked the video and comment down below with your ideas. And thanks until next time.